The open heath gave way to a series of farm buildings, and then the first outlying houses of Halbe, at some distance from the town itself. The capo's panther was already moving between the farm units, and ahead of him I could make out one of the king tigers which had spearheaded the breakout, its profile stark against the flames. All around, shells were detonating, knocking huge pieces out of the farmsteads and rocking us with their blast. In the swirling light, we almost collided with a Panzer IV, which was immobile, beside a barn. Peering through the periscopes, it was difficult to make out what was happening around us, with so much smoke and dust. I put my head up out of the cupola to try to see the way ahead. The roar of explosions and flames surged over me. The Panzer IV in front of us had shed its tracks, which were looped around it in ragged pieces. The Panzer crew were clamouring out on the hull, gesturing to me to accept them on board. As I shouted to them to climb on, though, figures emerged from trenches around us. Figures of men in Red Army padded jackets, and they began to swarm over the Panzer IV. In moments, the Panzer crew were shot down one man who jumped clear being stabbed through the neck with a bayonet by one of these Ivan Panzer hunters. My hull gunner and main gunner both fired their MGs and shot the men on the Panzer to pieces, both the Soviets and the dead bodies of the Panzer crew. The adversaries lay jumbled on top of each other in the light of the flames, their blood mingling on the armour plate. As soon as this danger was overcome, red panzers burst in among us. These were not the ordinary T-34s I saw immediately, as one of these monsters appeared through the smoke and began to traverse its squat, oblong turret onto us. These were Joseph Stalin types, the equal of a king tiger, with a slow but fatal main gun, more powerful even than an 88 bin Letos. I gave the bearing of one of them to my gunner. J.S., my gunner muttered in my headphones, and I felt the turret twitch as he traversed our 75 mm onto the Russian. I dropped back inside of the turret, where peering out through the periscopes I could barely see the Stalin, about 100 metres distant, shrouded in the smoke. That massive red panzer would normally stand back and pick its enemies off at distances of two kilometres or more, but in the dark and smoke it needed to come to close quarters to be able to see its prey. Its colossal main gun was gradually turning onto us, but our traverse was quicker, and our driver aided it by using the track differential to swivel our hull so that our gun came into alignment more rapidly. While the Ivan turret was still turning, we fired. The round deflected off its armour and disappeared into the smoke. Beside me, my 75 mem loader worked like a grim dervish on the breach, while the gun fumes filled the turret. We fired again. I blinked, wiped my eyes and stared at the JS. That round, I said. Is it? Yes. The gunner muttered, squinting through his gun sight. It's stuck in the armour. Our 75 mm projectile was sticking out of the JS turret armour, still smoking, like the horn on a devil. Reverse! We slammed backward, crashing through the wall of a barn as the JS fired on us. Its round flashed in front of us and flew off across the open heath towards the spree forest. We were at point-bank range with this Stalin panzer, blinded by smoke, in a zone that we had no knowledge of. The only thing we knew for certain was that we had to get through the town of Halbe, and this Stalin was barring our path. The Capo's panther was nowhere to be seen, and where were our king tigers? How would we break past these huge Ivan machines into the town and out to the west? Every thought, every breath was punctuated by the detonation of mortar rounds exploding between us and the Stalins. If we could not break past them, the Kessel exit would be sealed again and its hundred thousand inhabitants would meet a savage destiny. The Russian JS Panzer was notoriously slow to reload its huge gun, having, we believed, a two-part shell system in which the projectile and propellant were loaded separately, as on a battleship. In the time it took, my loader replenished our breach again, and I ordered my gunner to fire on the Stalin, which had shot at us but to hit him in the running gear, not the hull or turret. It was a difficult shot in the drifting smoke, with only the front of the Stalin's track visible as a target. We fired once, and the round deflected off the edge of the glacis by the track. 
We were reloaded and primed in seconds, and our second shot blew the right front track clean off the Stalin's drive wheel, making the machine rock on its axis. Before its crew could react, I ordered our driver to charge the Stalin and to veer around so that we were at its rear, where the armour plate was thinner over the engine. With mortar rounds bursting around us, we crashed out of the barn and over to the Stalin's right, then slowed and rotated around so that our gun was pointing at the red panzer's back plate. I saw the Stalin try to heave itself around on one track, but this was slow and our gunner was faster on his final traverse. Our precious armour-piercing shell smashed into the Stalin's thin back armour. The light from the overhead flares was so clear that I could see our round pierce the metal in a spray of dislodged fragments. The round deflected off something inside there and came shooting up vertically out of the engine grills, followed by a plume of sparks. The grills flew apart and a flash of flame lit up the whole Stalin, turning to oily smoke which coiled in tentacles around the vehicle as it shuddered and tried to move. We began to reverse from it, conserving our ammunition, but that Stalin crew was not done with us. As we turned to drive past the wrecked machine, I saw its hatches open and men climb out, calmly and orderly. Five men, some armed with machine pistols. Our hull gunner fired and knocked two of them down, but the armed men dodged towards us, getting so close to our flank that I lost sight of them beside the panther. We began to accelerate away but immediately crashed through the smoke into an earth mound which blocked our backward progress. Our cursing reached a crescendo of obscenity as our dish wheels slid while we tried to reverse over the mound, our hull up in the air and our tracks throwing out earth as our weight took us back down. As we landed with a crash, I heard the screech of our engine cut out and die. Our panther had stalled and we were stationary. None of us needed to curse our driver, he knew exactly what to do. He worked the starter lever, trying to engage the start motor, making the system whine but not catch, each sound tearing at our hearts. I saw our loader's eyes fill with tears, and I had no words to console him. Were we now to be stranded here, and forced to join the helpless swarms of people on foot rushing through the maelstrom of Halbe? Please, our gunner said. Come on, please, it won't catch, our driver muttered. It won't. I heard noises on the rear deck of the panther. Were they German troops, climbing aboard in the middle of the battlefield? I peered through the rear periscope and caught sight of a Russian tank crewman in his ribbed helmet, smashing at our engine grills with the butt of his machine pistol. The Verdam Reds wanted vengeance on us for destroying their fine Stalin panzer. I fired my pistol through the small port in the turret rear intended for this purpose, but the angle was wrong, and without engine power, we could only turn the turret slowly with the hand crank. If the Reds put one bullet into our fuel pipes, or one grenade under the grills, our panther would never start again. I slid open my cupola hatch, took my MP40 from the turret wall, and pointed the gun out over the top. I realised it was no use shooting like that, my bullets would surely go through our own grills. With no choice, I heaved myself out and came face to face with a red tank crewman who was trying to prime a flare pistol, pointing it down at the engine covers. I shot him and he tumbled off the deck, but his comrade was on top of me. Unarmed, the man smashed me in the face with his fist and I tasted thick blood in my mouth. I shot at him wildly and saw him jump from the panther onto the earth. Down there, a gang of our troops leaped forward, not only troops, but women too, armed with rifles and pistols. They set upon this man and cut him to pieces with shots and blows until one woman, armed with a civilian shotgun, administered the final blast to his face. At the same time, our engine rumbled and caught, and the panther came to life again under me. Comrade, take us with you, the ground troops shouted over the din. I could not deny the ground soldiers and civilians the chance to ride with us. The approach to Halbe would be murderous on the back of a panzer, but if they wished to take the danger, so be it. And their close quarters protection against marauding Russian infantry would be welcome. With this clutch of half a dozen armed fighters on our rear deck, 
I climbed back into the turret. We rounded the earth embankment and moved off towards Hull Bay itself in search of our other panzers and the route to the west. Coming through the outlying farm buildings, with me peering through the periscopes from inside the turret, I saw quickly how our SS King Tigers were engaged. The lights of flames and the parachute flares were still bright, and in that flickering glow I saw that our heavy panzers were fighting another row of Stalins. These red panzers were dug into the ground on the edge of the village itself, with only their turrets above the earth. I could see three of them, with their block-shaped turrets black against the flames behind them. Our king tigers were shooting them up from a range of less than one kilometre, blowing up clouds of soil as their high-explosive shells exploded around the emplaced starlins. One tiger was evidently firing armour-piercing, and I saw the tracer shells corkscrew off from the side of a Stalin's turret in the drifting smoke. On the other side of the Tigers, I thought I could make out the Capo's panther, behind a ridge, firing intermittently at the Stalins. Behind those few red panthers, the town of Halbe stood in flames, with artillery rounds exploding over it in starbursts that sent roof tiles and chimneys whirling for hundreds of metres. I guess that bombardment was the last of our artillery using its ammunition to break up the Soviet positions in the town. The Russian artillery, though, was now laying down a thick screen of explosions in front of the town, daring us to run the gauntlet of shrapnel even if we could defeat the Stalins. I did not anticipate that our panthers would be of great use in this initial fight against the Stalins that would take the King Tigers. Besides, I didn't need to count our ammunition. I knew it well enough barely twenty rounds of armour-piercing remaining, and ten rounds of high explosive. That would need to last until we were through the town, over the land to the west and inside the Twelfth Army Corridor. I kept my panther concealed in the rubble of a collapsed farmhouse, where the rafters and slates covered our profile, and, with our riders still cowering on our rear deck, I considered how to approach the town. I could see four King Tigers in all, firing on the three Stalins, their higher rate of fire undermined as an advantage by the ultra-low position of the red panzers in the ground. The tigers were having no success, and they were taking hits on their front plates from those massive battleship guns in the Stalin machines. One such hit struck a king tiger on the gun mantle, and I saw in an instant that the tracer shell deflected down and hit the deck hatches under the barrel. A hatch flew off into the air, and then a jet of sparks erupted from the deck. I shuddered to think of that Soviet warhead screaming around the inside of our panzer, ricocheting off the interior walls and carving a path through any human body that it touched. I had looked inside the hulks of many destroyed panzers, ours and the Russians, and I knew what the process did to flesh and bone. The King Tiger's turret hatches blew open, and in a moment its ammunition exploded, sending a helix of flame up from the open vents. Even as the panzer was enveloped in its burning gasoline, the other King Tigers took their revenge, focusing all their fire for a furious ten seconds on one of the embedded Stalins. My gunner chuckled to himself. With his telescopic sight, he had a better view than me, but even I could see the Stalin hit repeatedly by three, then four shells, until a great scab of metal broke away from the turret and span off across the ground. The broken shell of the turret exploded, throwing the crew members up into the air amid sparks and flames. They had scarcely fallen to earth before the King Tigers turned their fire to the second Stalin, which was hit immediately in the gun barrel where it joined the turret. That Stalin's barrel slumped and the huge machine began to reverse back out of its low emplacement. The overhead flares turned to orange and green, and in this lurid illumination we saw the Stalin reverse a few metres, exposing its upper hull to our tigers as it went back up the gradient. One 88 millet round punctured the forward hull, and another ripped open the engine deck as it rose into the air. The Stalin slumped back down into its trench, with crewmen beginning to drag themselves out of the hatches, their clothing and helmets on fire. I thought the tigers had finished with them, but one of the Waffen SS gunners insisted on firing a high explosive round, which exploded centrally on the Stalin. My gunner chuckled again. The red crewmen climbing out of the hatches were severed in half by the explosion their torsos blasted completely away, 
leaving only the stumps of their bodies jammed in the hatch openings. Its escape routes blocked and its hull shot to pieces, the Stalin began to burn. The third Stalin panzer was outnumbered now by three to one, but still it kept firing on the King Tigers. I had to admire its commander when, with 80 mm rounds smashing off its turret, the panzer reared up and burst out of its dug-in emplacement onto the open ground itself. There was to be no retreat for this hero of the Soviet Union, even if nobody ever knew his name or his actions. He was going down defiantly, taking his machine and his crew with him. That was achieved in a few seconds, as the Stalin began to race towards the three King Tigers, clearly intent on ramming one of them. The Tigers shot his tracks off with high explosive, and, as the Stalin careered sideways across the heath, they stood silently and watched as the Red Panzer crashed into a crater, flipped over slowly, and came to rest upside down, its turret in the earth now and its wheels in the sky. Flames licked around it slowly, but the King Tigers were already moving towards it, then past it, and then their lumbering profiles moved into the outskirts of the town itself. My panther followed, tucking in behind the capo's panther as he too emerged from his concealment and joined the column. Behind us, I saw through the periscopes in the glow of the flares and burning vehicles that hundreds of people were already following us closely. Troops, Wehrmacht, SS and civilians. In cars, trucks on foot and on Hanamags, as our breakout column slowly pushed ahead into the chaos of Halbe town. The battle at Halbe Halbe was once like a thousand small towns dotted across Germany. Timbered houses, merchants' halls, a market square, a church, a simple railroad station. Its buildings had been the homes of well-to-do farmers and dealers, neat and square. On this late April night, it was illuminated by parachutiflares, and by the flames erupting from its tilled roofs and timber window shutters. I went up out of the cupola to see better and to guide my driver. The first thing that I saw, in the gardens of the houses on the outskirts, were the bodies of dead civilians strewn about everywhere twenty or thirty people of all a giz, who seemed to have been caught by shellfire. We passed these pale bodies, and followed the other panzers between the houses into the main street of the town. As we halted there, I took in the scene. Our King Tigers were positioned along the main street, their turrets level with the upper windows of the old buildings. The Capo's Panther was in front of me. From behind us, German troops and civilians were starting to stream through the gaps in the houses and emerge into this main street, huddling close to the Panzers. Some troops, those who retained combat discipline and were armed, moved slowly along the building frontages, checking for signs of red infantry. These men exchanged fire with Russians in the first houses, shooting through the windows and throwing in grenades to clear them out. Each shot and explosion made the civilians huddle closer to the panzers, and not only the civilians, many German troops were unarmed and simply following us as non-combatants, with no interest in sharing the fighting. These men, some walking wounded, but many able-bodied, let their comrades do the dangerous work while they stayed back in the shadow of the panzers. Overhead, the drifting parachute flares began to burn themselves out, and no more were fired from beyond the town. This meant that the Reds knew we had captured the place, and they wanted to give us no advantage of light. The fighting in the houses took place in a renewed darkness, lit by flames and gun flashes, with men scrambling among the wreckage of the house fronts and doorways. I saw the German infantry drag the remaining Reds out by their collars and belts, throwing them onto the cobblestones and surrounding them. To save ammunition, they killed the prisoners with their rifle butts, boots and with entrenching spades, clubbing and stabbing them to death. The civilians peered around the panzers to witness this killing. Old men, women and children too. By the time this was done, this end of the street was littered with mangled red corpses, visible in the fires of the burning buildings. With the street secured, it was the stage to move on and through the town to the west. Looking behind us, I could make out a great river of people on foot, horses, carts and unarmoured vehicles, 
bulging up in this bottleneck of the main street. As the King Tigers moved ahead, screened by the combatant infantry, our two panthers moved off slowly after them, and the mass of people to our rear followed too. At first they stayed behind our panther, but then in a few metres many of them ran past us, weaving between the bodies along the street, stumbling from one panzer to the next, until the whole street was packed with thousands of people on foot, all rushing towards the other side of the town. When this surge of people was at its height, and the street was a dense moving river of human heads, swirling forwards between the panzers like islands in a flood. At this point, the Red Artillery opened fire on the town. Of course, the Reds had their observers hidden nearby, communicating the situation to their commanders, and they had plotted them coordinates of the main street carefully in advance. Even so, the bombardment that they unleashed on the street was merciless and devastating in its accuracy. The first shell exploded behind us, throwing a large number of people into the air and sending broken cobblestones whirling along the narrow transit like missiles. The shells burst in a calculated line going forward, from the rear of the column towards the front. The explosions ripped the tightly packed crowd apart, sending some bodies crashing against the house fronts and others through the shattered windows of the storefronts. I caught sight of a soldier and a civilian woman, blasted off their feet and blown into a shop, where they lay among the burning goods while the building caught fire around them. My driver shouted a question to me. Shall I advance at speed, Herr Feldwebel, to reach the other end of the street? I tried to see in front of us. The King Tigers were accelerating, and as they picked up speed to get away from the explosions, they struck and crushed many people on foot around them. Some bodies were thrown sideways, while others were dragged under the huge metal treads, or simply disappeared beneath the King Tiger's massive hull. At the same time, the artillery increased even more in intensity, with rounds bursting in the street and against the buildings every few seconds, both explosive rounds and incendiary rockets. At this point, the road in front of my panther exploded in a spray of white fire, a light so intense that it hurt my eyes to look at it even through the periscopes. I recognised this as a magnesium or phosphorus shell, and I felt the heat surge over our panzer as the fire grew. The burning chemical expanded in the air, creating huge spirals that grew to a height of several metres against the frontage of the house beside the street. The building began to burn as the white substance dripped like a molten waterfall down its surface. There were civilians in the building and I saw some of them try to jump out through windows away from the fire, but the blazing chemical kept expanding and caught the people as they leapt. They fell, completely on fire, into the street, and the entire house began to collapse on top of them where they lay. In front of us was an armoured car, an eight-wheeled command vehicle, and this car reversed suddenly, away from the flames, hitting our front plate with a substantial impact. I heard the car rev and its wheels scream as they span on the cobbles, but my radio man called up to me that the vehicle's rear fender was jammed under our front plate. There was a flash from the car itself, and flames began to spread up its angular surface. Its crew began to jump from the upper hatches. It seemed that the armoured car's fuel tank was split and leaking, and the gasoline was pouring onto the street under our panzer. Shells were bursting around us too, and the front of the burning building was collapsing into the street. I told my driver to take us forward, regardless of what was in front of us. We crushed the rear of the armoured car and bulldozed it aside. The panther reared up into the air as we lurched over the rubble of the collapsed house, through the phosphorus flames and into the street beyond. Here, in the light of the flames, I could see some of our Volkssturm infantry fighting with more red soldiers who were firing from behind a wrecked T-34. We bulldozed the red panzer, pushing it aside and crushing some of the Russian infantry who were behind it. I saw that the survivors were set upon by our Volkssturm men, who knocked them down with carbine butts and even panzerfausts, which they wielded as clubs. As the reds were subdued, hundreds of people began to surge forward again along the street, making for the far end. Behind us, the bombardment continued in its ferocious intensity. 
I ordered the driver not to accelerate, as I could not bear the thought of crushed women and children under my tracks, however great the danger from the bombardment. As it was, the crowds were surging and scrambling away from the central part of the street, fighting each other to get into the smashed house fronts, into the side alleyways or even under the trees that lined the edges of the boulevard, to find any shelter from the explosions. Those that made it to the edges cowered there, squeezed against each other and transfixed in confusion, while those still in the middle of the street charged madly towards the far end where they knew the route to the west lay. Slowly, the space in front of us was cleared of people. As the street emptied, we were able to pick up speed, and we travelled at about twenty kilometres per hour for a short distance, aiming for the western end which was framed between two high houses. I was still up out of the turret, with masonry and shrapnel whipping around me, and a few of our complement of riders were still crouched on our engine deck, clinging frantically to the grills and equipment hooks. I thought that we were going to be successful, and reach the western end, but without warning one of the King Tigers appeared in front of us, actually reversing backwards between the final houses into the main street again, his exhausts flaring. He came to a halt, traversing his turret, and began firing with his barrel below horizontal at something in the space beyond the street, which we could not see around the corner of the houses. I had the feeling now that the Reds were playing with us, simply manoeuvring us around for their sport. They had allowed our column to enter and fill the narrow street, then started their bombardment just as our people were at their most exposed. Now they were blocking us off, sealing us into this death channel, with most of our heavy panzers already out somewhere beyond the edge of the town. Another artillery round exploded behind our panther, and I heard screams from my rear deck as shrapnel cut into the people riding on our hull. Debris smashed off my cupola and hit me in the back, and I dropped down into the turret with stabs of pain shooting through my spine. I grabbed the 75 mm gun breech for support, and the loader steadied me and unfastened my jacket to see the wound. Outside the panther, metal was breaking in waves against our armour plate and making our machine rock like a boat. The pain in my back prevented me from thinking about the effect of the explosions on the people taking cover in the street. At times, as the loader probed my back injury, I could hear long screams from outside, in the brief intervals between the explosions and the King Tiger firing his gun. I think that I also heard people beating and pounding on our armour, trying to climb aboard or calling desperately for help. At one moment, the open hatch of the cupola was filled with the hysterical, screaming face of a woman, begging to come into the panzer. I would have permitted her, but another shell exploded close to us, and she disappeared in a plume of smoke and debris. Halbe was being systematically destroyed, I realised, from one end to the other end, second by second. I grunted as my loader removed the second of two shell splinters from my back, and then splashed antiseptic on the wound. I shuddered in pain, but was still grateful that I was inside the panther, and not outside in the raging maelstrom of the street. I gulped down an amphetamine tablet and let the loader give me a short jab from a morphine capsule enough to deaden the pain, but not enough to knock me out. I felt numb, wooden, and my limbs became distant from my body. I looked through the periscopes forward and saw the King Tiger in front of us advancing slowly, surrounded by a mob of armed soldiers, civilians and others. There was a Kubelwagen, jeep beside the rear of the panzer, and soldiers were fighting for space inside it, raining blows on each other. One man raised a pistol and shot an officer through the chest, and then the King Tiger jerked sideways as it accelerated, its massive tracks crushing the Kubelwagen, the officer and the mutinous soldier, destroying them and others under its treads. With explosions blowing slabs of masonry off the walls of the houses around us, and entire buildings collapsing in bursts of smoke. We advanced behind the King Tiger out of the main street, being forced to drive over the crushed Kubelwagen and its shattered human debris as we progressed. Rounding the corner, I saw what the King Tiger had been firing at. A pair of T-34 panzers were wedged between two buildings, their front hulls shot away and the bodies of their crews burning as they hung out of the hatches. Was that the Red's last ambush? 
or were there more tricks still to come? Around us, the ragged mass of our foot travellers scuttled and jumped alongside our panther. This road had fewer opportunities for cover than the main street, being open on one side, but this allowed the people to spread out into the fields to the left in an attempt to avoid the exploding shells which were falling all around us. In all my experience in the east, I had not seen a bombardment this intense, shells landing one on top of the other, the dust cloud of one explosion being torn apart by the explosion of the next round, and among them the incendiary rockets crashing and exploding across the street and the open spaces. Perhaps it was the amphetamine cocktail, but I grew immune to the sight of these rockets bursting among the hundreds of people who swarmed beside us, sending dozens of them tumbling in grotesque somersaults with their bodies on fire, their burning limbs carving patterns on my retina as they flailed in the dim light. A pair of horses pulling a cart were set on fire, and they stampeded insanely, throwing the civilians in the cart out behind them as they kicked and trampled on anyone unlucky enough to be in their path, until an artillery shell killed the animals in a puff of whirling flesh. Several times we had to halt while the king tiger in front of us dealt with threats that appeared from one side or another, its turret traversing and spitting tracer from its coaxial machine gun into the night. The great panzer had a group of SS troops on its back hull, and these men fired with MP40 and heavy machine guns into the houses as they saw enemy troops lurking in there. We came on a partly collapsed building which had red troops firing from the rubble. An anti-tank rocket flew out from this strong point in a trail of fire and exploded against one of the huge concave wheels of the King Tiger. The wheel flew off, spinning like a coin, and for a moment I thought that the panzer was doomed. But the SS men leaped from the hull and stormed the red position, throwing themselves onto the enemy guns. The surviving reds swarmed out, firing their machine pistols into the mass of troops and civilians, running and swerving among the throng and shooting at random. I pulled myself up through the hatch to see what was happening, and grabbed my machine pistol, climbing out onto the hull when I realised what was taking place. In the light of the burning buildings, I could see these ten or twelve red troops who knew they were about to die, but wanted to take as many Germans as possible with them running madly through the ranks, shooting and yelling. Half of the Reds were felled in moments by shots or blows, and they disappeared under German boots as they were kicked and mauled to death. But others charged into a mass of civilians, shooting and cutting down women and children with sustained bursts of fire. One of these attackers was killed when an incendiary rocket landed near him, bounced into the air and decapitated him as he ran. His body ran on for several metres, still firing his gun, until it stumbled and fell. I jumped off the panther, feeling no pain from my wounds, and shot down two of the other reds as they ran berserk among the fleeing civilians. Some of our troops came to my aid, shooting at the reds and bringing them down, but many others, even those who had guns, were rooted to the ground with exhaustion or fear, and simply watched us as we, the more determined fighters, took on the enemy. In seconds, we had shot down all these Ivans, and the civilians were searching their bodies for food and pistols, even as the corpses steamed in the flickering light. I clambered back onto the panther, my body still numb, my mind clouded. We drove on down this exit street for 50 metres, then 100 metres, away from the most intense area of bombardment. The artillery barrage slackened here, with the red guns still focusing on the central part of the town, where a dreadful massacre must surely be taking place. Looking back to the central area, I could make out a mass of people not hundreds, but many thousands of them crawling out from the street exit, dragging themselves away from the fire zone. Behind them, the buildings of central Halbe were completely aflame, and shells were still bursting over the houses with a frantic rhythm. What was the fate of the thousands who were still trying to break through back there, through the rockets and shell bursts in between the collapsed houses? As if in answer to my question, a truck appeared in the exit from the main street, an open vehicle with a cab and a flat body. The body was loaded with troops and civilians, their bodies streaming with smoke and sparks. The truck was on fire, 
with flames erupting from its engine, and it careered out of control into the crowd in the open space, running down many people who were then left where they fell. The truck rolled to a halt, and the flames around it grew and began to roar. I saw that none of the people on its body tried to move, dismount or climb off. Either too badly hurt, too terrified or too uncaring of their fate, they remained piled on the truck while it exploded into flames, and the fire consumed them rapidly. I looked ahead again, towards the darkness at the end of this road, a shadowy space not illuminated by flares, fires or explosions. Beside us, the survivors on foot herded forward, following the panzers towards their hope of safety. We slowed to walking pace as I crouched on the turret top, communicating with my driver through the interphone, trying to make out what was ahead of us. I could not see the King Tigers, but I made out the exhausts of the Capo's panther in the darkness, progressing slowly at an even pace. After several hundred metres, I noticed the people on the ground around us beginning to pick up speed, starting to run with their remaining energy towards the dark but silent area ahead. Motorcycles, trucks and horses streamed past us, dim shapes in the gloom, these vehicles and carts swerving among the foot traffic, all of us racing for the way out of Halby. It seems that we are through, sir, my gunner said in my earphones. There is nothing beyond. It looks like the road going west. I grunted a response partly in doubt, partly because the pain of my back wound was starting to lever into my senses. My back was cool and wet, and I touched it to find it slick with blood. Perhaps when we were finally through, when we were crossing the land beyond Halbe, then I could find a medic and have the wounds dressed. I really think we're through, my driver said from his position down in the front hull. I can see a sign ahead. What does it say, sir? I peered into the dark, my vision doubling as if I was drunk. There was a sign there, some kind of placard on a roadside tree, white with black letters, and as we approached, I saw that it was a hand-painted route marker. All German traffic progress right. The secure route is through the railroad station by order Reichfield Police. I told the driver to rotate right and to advance slowly towards the station. The mass of people around us swarmed together, reading the sign, shouting out in hopes of deliverance, believing they were almost out of the Kessel. After a hundred metres, we passed a solitary German soldier in a clean, tidy uniform, a man who appeared well-fed and healthy. I was so accustomed to the sight of our ragged, patched-up infantry that I noted this immediately, even in the moonlight and in my drugged state. He directed us to the right, using a field police direction pointer, and he saluted professionally. I did not have time to note his insignia, and anyway, the light was getting too dim. Following his directions, we progressed right, and, in a few moments, I saw the iron footbridge of the railway station in front of us under the moon. More of these clean, professional German soldiers appeared beside the road, waving us forward and pointing to the station area. We're through, my driver said. See these field police fellows? They must have come up from the 12th Army Zone. We'll be linking up soon, sir, won't we? If they're the 12th Army, they're too far forward, my gunner said. They should be 30 kilometres to the west. I nodded at his comment, looking at another of the field police in his smartly pressed uniform as he waved us on to the station zone. I suddenly shouted to my driver to halt, and the panther ground to a stop in a swirl of dust and earth. The foot traffic did not halt, but surged around us, a multitude of troops, civilians and wheeled transports following the police directions to the station. Even the troops clinging to our rear deck jumped off, now that we were halted, and joined the crowd surging forward along the road. I looked down at the field policeman his eyes invisible under the rim of his helmet and his uniform devoid of insignia. What unit are you with? I called to him, over the noise of explosions from the town and the tramping of the foot soldiers charging past towards the station. Field police, Herr Feldwebel, the man saluted. I climbed down from the panther slowly, with pain rippling through my spine, and stood in front of him. The hundreds of foot soldiers and civilians charged around us, 
shouting encouragement to each other. Which unit of field police? I asked the man, over the heads of the people rushing between us. You must hurry, Herr Feldwebel, he called to me. The Reds are close. Which unit of police? I shouted, being rocked and jostled by the many troops rushing past. A civilian woman passed between us, dragging a child in each hand, children of five or six years, trailing their feet in exhaustion. The rail station, she was saying. We will be safer there. Which unit are you with? I shouted to the field police soldier. Which unit? He was gone. He had retreated into the shadows away from the road, and I caught sight of his back as he ducked between trees in the pasture, dodging away from us. Seidlitz Truppe, I yelled. These are Seidlitz men. The Seidlitz men were a curse on us all. Seidlitz troops were German soldiers who had surrendered to the Reds in the east and had agreed to work for them to disrupt our lines and cause confusion. I had heard of them often but never seen one until now. They were notorious for exactly this wearing German uniforms. They planted false signposts, directed traffic wrongly, and fouled up the plans of entire regiments. Hundreds of people began breaking and running past our panzer towards the station. I could see them converging in the moonlight on the access road, running, limping, dragging themselves towards what they thought was safety. These are Seidlitz men, I shouted to the onrushing troops, trying to push them back. Several of them halted, and a knot of troops and civilians gathered around me, but the vast bulk of this tide of people surged on past us. I shouted to them to stop, to stay away from the station, to ignore the signs. Inside the station, the shooting began within seconds. I saw the muzzle flashes light up the footbridge in the darkness, not only from one side, but from both ends of the site. Screams tore the air among the rapid, unceasing machine gun shots, and the crowd surging to the station faltered, stumbled, and many fell. The people behind them, though, were confused and running blindly, not seeing where the shots were coming from, and they kept rushing on, trampling and stamping on those who were falling. Within seconds, in addition to the massacre taking place inside the station, the ground around our panzer was strewn with wounded and trampled foot soldiers, civilians and children, as the crowd broke and began to run wildly for any available cover. I leaped back onto the panther and ordered the driver to advance on the station. That was hopeless, though the entrance area was thick with people, especially civilians with carts, huddling together and not knowing which way to turn. The shooting from the station reached a crescendo, and grenades began to explode in there, with the characteristic hollow crack of the Soviet bombs that spread such vicious splinters. The dim landscape was lit by these flashes, and by the shouts and screams of the trapped victims from within the station precincts, and still by the fires and detonations of the bombardment in Halbe itself. A soldier came running out of the station, his face a mask of blood, his eyes wide and staring. Make the people follow you, he shouted to me. They will follow a panzer, Herr Feldwebel. Lead them away from the station, for God's sake. But the people in the station, they are dead, all dead, he shouted. Lead these others away, in the name of God. We drove the panther slowly away from the station, across the open ground, scattering the milling crowds of leaderless, confused soldiers and frantic civilians. They formed up behind us, in the constant manner of stragglers, and stumbled after us as we moved away. I dreaded encountering landmines in this open space, or a return of the intense artillery bombardment, but we entered a heathland punctuated by bracken and scrub in which, with only the moonlight and distant flames, it was difficult to make out any way ahead. A civilian man who knew the area climbed up beside me, and with his directions we crawled away from Halbe, picking up a narrow road that crossed the Halbe rail line at a barrier point. This crossing was strewn with abandoned trucks and equipment, and beyond it the road led west through overhanging trees, going into a forest. There were flashes here as artillery shells exploded in the fields on either side, but these were fired randomly and caused only limited casualties to the massed ranks behind us. It became too dark to navigate, 
or to steer, and the danger of shedding a track or grounding the panther and damaging its running gear was a constant anxiety. A shape loomed up in front of us, with two red glowing stacks, and we almost collided with the Capo's panther, which was stationary at a curve in the forest track. We took the decision to halt and move on at first light. A few minutes later, at around two in the morning, our two panthers were concealed under trees off the road, and the horde of infantry and others who had followed us away from the station were finding places to lay themselves down on the pine needles between the tree trunks. From among the infantry, we posted a perimeter guard, and then we broke into a forestry hut that our civilian guide found for us. Inside, in the dark, the capo said, So we are through Halbe. The king tigers are somewhere ahead now. We have simply lost touch with them. We must carry on by ourselves for now. We have to watch out for those Sadlitz men. I hear that the station was packed with dead bodies, three or four deep. We can identify the Sadlitz men by their uniforms, I said. They are clean and well presented, unlike our troops. The capo peered through the window shutter at the crowds of troops and civilians outside. Our troops know that the war is lost, he said. How many want to fight now? Only a quarter or a third of our men will fight any longer. The rest will let others fight for them. Then we will fight with the quarter or the third, I said. The capo lit a kerosene lamp on minimum light and unfolded a map. I took this from a dead artillery man, he said. See here, it shows where we are. He showed me our location. We were in a triangular stretch of woodland, southwest of Halbe, which was bisected by the country railroad and by various forestry tracks. The map extended west to the Elbe itself, where the Twelfth Army were holding open the corridor that would lead us to the Americans. Between our patch of forest and the Twelfth Army were two remaining milestones to cross. First, the north-south autobahn that ran up and down this part of Germany, dead straight. We believed that the Russians had just charged up this autobahn in their advance on Berlin itself to the north. If so, most of their forces would be fighting in Berlin, leaving the rural hinterland thinly guarded. That's the plan, the capo said, and after we cross the autobahn, we have to cross the railroad line about 20 kilometres further. After that, we should find the Twelfth Army boys waiting for us, and then, hello America. His finger moved across the map the autobahn, the railroad, and then the river Elbe. I laughed in a grim way, but that only made the pain in my back sharper. In the past, I had slept easily enough in a panzer. The thin metal chair made a good perch, and you rested your head on the turret wall or on the gun breech, with your forehead on your linked fingers for a pillow. If you were in the panzer all night, a shell case was your toilet, and fresh air came from opening the hatch to empty it. In this way, three men could pass the night in the turret cage and the other two crewmen on their seats in the hull. On that night in the woodland west of Halbe, though, I did not want to sleep. I took another mouthful of amphetamines, painkillers and schnapps. The forest around my panther was not sleeping either. It was filled with voices, cries, the wailing of children and the sound of equipment being readied for our next stage of the breakout. Searching for aspirin, I fumbled in my tunic pocket and found the photo of the young woman that the lady on the panther's deck had given me before she died. A grey light was coming through the cupola, and I climbed out to examine the photo more fully. The girl was a beauty, and like all lonely soldiers, I imagined that she might be good, understanding company for a man such as me. There was an address on the back, a town to the west of the Elbe, in the American-occupied sector of Germany. There was no name for the girl. I smiled and put the photo safely in my pocket again. A few birds were singing, but that stopped as the sound of bombardment grew from the countryside to our west. Close at hand, in the forest, there was more noise, shouting and cursing, and people clamouring for attention. I went into the trees to see what this was. I found a scrum of our soldiers hunched over something on the ground in the dawn light. I pushed through them, and with the authority that came from a panzer uniform at this point in the fighting, the infantry made way for me slowly. 
I found that a group of German troops had found a Seidlitz man. The Seidlitz agent was pressed back against the roots of a tree, clenching his fists, gritting his teeth. His field grey uniform had a German eagle but no swastika, and one of our men handed me an armband that had been in the Seidlitz man's pocket. In the service of the National Committee for a Free Germany, this was what the Seidlitz agents called their organisation. Looking around, I realised that the small crowd did not only contain soldiers. Various German women were present, some of them armed, and also a handful of children and youths of about 10 years to maybe 15 years of age. One of the women stepped forward and threw a rope upward over the branch of the nearest tree. An aircraft flew overhead, then another two planes, so low that their slipstream shook the tree canopy. I heard their cannon firing into the forest to the east, and then the slow thump of exploding vehicles from somewhere over there. With this background, the Seidlitz man was hanged on the tree, his throat emitting a dreadful rattle, while the circle of troops, youths and women watched. His jerking, kicking heels were seized by a German boy of ten or twelve years, who swung and pulled on them to break the Seidlitz man's neck and silence the hideous sounds that were coming from his mouth. It is not decent, I heard the boy say to his mother, as the hanged man's feet swung around silently in a circle above us. Such sounds are not decent in a German forest. <laughs>